Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here for the second year running. It must mean that I did something right on the first year. But isn't it a wonderful venue and what fantastic speakers we've had all morning and you're sitting here in the heat thinking how much longer before lunch and then you get somebody like me coming on to talk to you about international aid and schooling. Wonderful to be here. My talk is going to be in sort of two halves. It's a game of two halves. The first half, I'm going to talk about international aid from a macro perspective, if you like. And then the second half is going to be from a micro perspective. And that's going to be looking at a case study of schooling in developing countries. And that's really where my area of expertise lies. Now, we all know, don't we, that we benefit from international aid. We benefit from international aid to become a professor for example, in a leading university. We can also get a knighthood from the Queen. Or we can become a banker and look after the money for our citizens in a Swiss bank account, just to keep it safe, really. Well, we have to remember that there is an industry built around international aid. There are vested interest groups, aren't there? Look at the Sustainable Development Goals. They're designed, monitored, and evaluated by people like me. There's 169 goals, and there's, sorry, there's 169 targets with 17 goals. That's a lot of goals and a lot of targets. And now, it's not like the Millennium Development Goals, where it was just focused on developing countries, but it's on every country in the world. Why do we have international aid? When did it start? Why do we have it? Well, international aid is a recent phenomenon. Before international aid, we had great philanthropists. Here we see Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, the great philanthropist, the 19th century industrialist. He said, wealth is not to feed our egos, but to feed the hungry and to help people help themselves. And that's really important. In the last 18 years of his life, Andrew Carnegie gave away $350 million dollars to charities, foundations, and universities. In today's money, that will be $13.7 billion. We still have philanthropists today, don't we? We have Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, to name but a few, but we don't have as many as we used to. Why is that? Because we have international aid. Now, international aid can be divided into different parts, bilateral and multilateral aid. Bilateral is government to government aid, and multilateral is government to uh, other agencies like the UN and the World Bank. Now, international aid was really stimulated by the Marshall Plan in 1948. Before the end of the Second World War, we didn't have international aid. It was the fact that America gave us $13 billion to reconstruct Europe after the Second World War, and it really worked. We had people like John Maynard Keynes saying, well, if it works in Europe, why can it not work in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa? Why can we not eradicate poverty in the developing world by giving money in order to eradicate poverty? So it was the Marshall Plan that really kick-started international aid. There are also economic, moral, and political justifications for aid as well, and you can see some of them here. You know, eradicating poverty is a, a really big one. How about something like the welfare state? It's a welfare state, an international one, isn't it? It's trying to give from rich countries to poor countries. And also, there's the political arguments as well for national and international security and stability. But how much do we give? How much does the UK give in international aid? Well, the target, and we've reached this in 2014, is 0.7% of gross national income. That's how much we give. And you can see the costings there. We actually give 11.7 billion pounds, 6.8 billion in bilateral aid and 4.8 billion multilateral aid. And you can see there the United Kingdom, there's only four Nordic countries giving more of their gross national income than we do, and that's Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, and Sweden, and then all the other countries, these are the DAC countries, uh, come behind us in percentage of gross national income. Most people would say that humanitarian aid is a good thing, isn't it? Short-term aid to assist when there are natural disasters. And that can achieve a lot. It can achieve a lot by saving lives. We actually give 1.1 billion in 2014, just in one year, to humanitarian aid. The largest regional recipient of UK bilateral aid is Africa at 2.6 billion. The largest country recipient is Ethiopia with 322 million. And this is the continents. Here are the continents here. You see that Africa gets 2.6 billion. 
Asia, surprisingly, India in 2014, although the aid has decreased a little bit, got 1.8 billion. And then you get the other continents actually decreasing from then. This is the sector breakdown. You can see the bigger bubbles means that you get a bigger part of the pie, if you like. And you can see that education is within the top five. We've got health and education and humanitarian aid. Education is 821 million goes to education. You have to think that that includes schooling. I just want to throw something out here that remember education is always not necessarily the same as schooling. But can international aid work? When does it best work and can it work? Aid skeptics like Dambisa Moyo, she's an international economist and author. You might have seen her on YouTube. She's quite famous for writing a book called Dead Aid. She doesn't believe that aid can work. She says that aid has helped make the poor poorer and growth slower. Systematic aid leads to the expansion of government bureaucracies into which the aid flows. Aid benefits the politi political elite, propping up corrupt governments, providing them with freely usable cash that is typically mismanaged, stolen, and disappears through bribery, fraudulent claims, and outright theft. So she doesn't think that aid can work. Neither does Professor William Easterly. He's a professor of economics at New York uh, University, and you might have read his book, The White Man's Burden. Easterly sees the problem is with planners. It's people who plan, people who think they know best. What do we think is best for the poor? Rather than the searchers, that's those people in the field who know what's going on. How do planners know what the poor need? Also, he's not a great fan of quantity of aid. The UK government have gone down the path of 0.7% of gross national income. Quantity, maybe, rather than quality. Isn't it better to have a small amount of aid that is effective and efficient and is working? That's what William Easterly would say. And then we have one of my favorites, George Aiti. George Aiti is author and president of the Free African Foundation in Washington, DC. Brilliant book, there he is. Bono's hiding behind the book for some reason. I think he hadn't quite read it yet. Uh, because George Aiti says, Africa's begging bowl leaks. It's a bucket full of holes, and it can only hold a certain amount of water for a certain amount of time. Pouring in more water makes little sense, as it will drain away. To the extent that there are internal leaks in Africa, corruption, census civil wars, wasteful military expenditure, capital flight, and government waste, pouring in more foreign aid makes little sense. I really don't think Bono had read it yet. So what's important in developing countries is that the institutions are in place to allow prosperity. And some would argue that the reason the Marshall Plan worked and the reason there was a rebuilding of Europe was because these institutions were in place in Europe and they're not currently in place in places like sub-Saharan Africa. So what do we need? Well, we need the rule of law. The principles around the rule of law, and you can see them in that triangle there. We need presumption of innocence. We need the right to silence. We need fair trial and independence of the judiciary. We need these principles and these rule of law for aid in order to succeed. We need property rights. We need people to be able to say, this is my property and you can't have it. We need a consumer society. That's all going to stimulate growth. Political freedom. This is a map of political freedom here. I have a friend from Durham University who says that if a country has democracy or democratic in its title, it probably isn't. Think about the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's the stripy one there in the middle, I think. And also we need freedom of press, don't we? We need to be able to make fun of our politicians, especially at moments like this. So does, does international aid work? We've, it's been a bit dodgy, my talk so far. It's, it's not looking like it's going in the right direction if uh, you're thinking it might. But why don't we look at schooling as a case study? Because that's where I'm an expert. Uh, that's where my expertise lies in developing countries. As you remember from those bubbles, it's one of the quite big bubbles, education. It gets quite a lot of aid. But this is aid typically to government schools. If we're talking about schools, it's really government schools that would get this aid. This is the uh, SDGs, number four, and 4.1 says, you know, ensure by 2030, all girls and boys complete free, and that's an important word there, free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education, leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. And that word free uh, is something that I think about. 
So all I want you to do is just, for 10 seconds, think about what sort of things you would spend aid on. If you were going to give it to schools in Africa, what sort of things would you spend it on? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and just quickly name two things. Ready, steady, go. That sounds like a lot of aid there. That's, that sounds great. Some great ideas. Some people didn't participate, so I'm assuming they're a researcher, not, uh, not thinking about being a planner here. Okay, so probably what you mentioned was something uh, that could improve inputs and something about facilities and something that's going to stimulate quality and student outcomes. So I think if you did any of those, that's a, a really good go. Um, this is... Uh, some work that I did in Tanzania while we were gathering the data, and that's one of my researchers there. You might have mentioned desks. You know, give children desks. No, somebody, no, we didn't mention desks over here. It might have been desks. How about toilets? How about improving classrooms? Yeah? What about textbooks? Giving free textbooks? Maybe some people said that. No, people were saying we didn't say that. Or what about teacher training? Maybe teacher training would work. So, you know, we've thought, mind you, we're doing, acting as a planner here because we're doing a top-down approach, what we think would really benefit government schools. The problem is we have a very demotivated teacher union, te teachers in, government teachers in developing countries. This is a teacher, um, this is in Ghana, fast asleep as the BBC were taking uh, uh, cameras, uh, taking a, making a program in his classroom fast asleep. These are teachers as well in Tanzania. They're supposed to be teaching, but they're outside texting. So this is me as a searcher, having seen that in developing countries, government schools, specifically in slum areas and low-income areas, aren't working. They're not working because, you see, these teachers, they're not from the slum areas themselves. They're not from the communities. And they haven't applied to be a teacher at this school either. They're sent by the district education officer to work in the school. They have nothing in common with the children in these communities. They actually think, many teachers in government schools, think that children from poor areas aren't capable of learning. They have parents who are illiterate, so they're not capable. They're first-generation learners. If we're going to throw aid, desks, chairs, toilets, teacher training, it's not going to work in government schools. And that's what happens when you're a planner. You think what's working here might work there. If you're not a searcher, you don't actually know what's happening on the ground. Let's look at aid to schools. Let's look at the corruption that occurs. Um, Kenyan education ministers were accused of misappropriating $1.3 million of DFID and World Bank funding provided by education projects in 2010. $17.3 million worth of textbooks were lost in Kenya, allegedly through destruction, theft, and fraud. And what you also have to think about, if you start sending free textbooks and giving things free, what happens to the people who are selling them in the marketplace? You know, there's those unintended consequences of giving things for free. And also, millions have been allocated to schools that don't even exist. They might be on a list, but when you go out to find them, they don't actually exist. What about planners? We just all acted as planners there, thinking what was best. In India and Kenya, aid money has been spent on toilets, which it sounds like a really good idea, but there's no, to there's no water to flush them. So you're building something that isn't going to work. In India, aid money was spent on 8,000 televisions provided to schools that didn't have electricity. So if you thought about providing computers, if there's no electricity, that's not going to work either. But it's fine because those televisions were stolen on the way to the schools, so they actually didn't get there. What about building a school? Lots of people build schools, don't they? It's, it's, it's like a great thing to do in your gap year, go out and build a school, but actually then there might not be a teacher to teach in them. So what is happening on the ground then? This is where my expertise actually comes into its own, I would say. For 17 years, I've been going around the world, and these are some of the countries that I visited, in order to find out how children from the age of maybe 5 to 16 are being educated in some of the poorest parts of sub-Saharan Africa and in India. And you can see, for example, in Nigeria, in Lagos State, when we went to Lagos State, Badagri, Kosafi, and Surali, three really uh, low-income parts of Lagos, we found that 75% of children are going to private schools. Now, we're not talking about elite private schools, as this is what I talked about last year. We're talking about low-cost 
private schools. These schools charge maybe two to three pounds per month, and the people that attend them are children of auto rickshaw drivers, market traders, and so on. And the parents want the best schooling they can for their children. They know if they go to the government school, the teacher's going to be asleep, they're going to be outside. They're not going to be from the communities themselves. So poor parents are prepared to pay that price in order to get their children a schooling. And about two to three pounds a month is about 6% of minimum wage. So it's very affordable for the poor. So that was in uh, Nigeria, 75% in Lagos State, in those three areas of Lagos State, are going to low-cost private schools. In Kenya, in Kibera, which is a slum area the size of Central Park, initially in 2003, when the free primary education was introduced, we found 70 private schools in the slum area itself. We were told, I don't know why you're in Kenya, you won't find any private schools. But that's what is brilliant about being a researcher and somebody at the cutting edge. You, you mustn't take what people say, oh, well, there's, there's no private schools there, is there? How do you know? That's what you have to think as a researcher. As a young person, you guys have got such a fantastic world ahead of you to find out things for yourselves and become brilliant researchers. So we found uh, 70, and then we went back five years later, and then we found 90 schools there. In India, we worked in Hyderabad, in Andhra Pradesh, and in Delhi. Again, 65% of children in poor areas are going to these low-cost private schools. We've done some work now in post-conflict zones, Liberia, South Sudan, and Sierra Leone. Interestingly, there are many different types of schools there, and Sierra Leone is doing a decentralization of their education system because they know that the government can't afford to provide schools, even if they provided schools of quality. In Sierra Leone, you have different types of schools. You have NGO, you have community, you have private proprietor, you have government, and you have faith schools, you have religious schools as well in Sierra Leone. Parents don't trust government schools in Sierra Leone. Some of their children were kidnapped during the conflict, so why would you send your child to a government school? They're very afraid. It's safety that they want, and therefore, lots of other schools are there. As I say, why are parents voting with their feet away from government schools, poor parents? It's because they want quality. We've now tested 36,000 children around the world, and I say now, I'm talking about uh, researchers at Newcastle University, and we find that children in private schools, low-cost private schools, outperform children in government schools, and sometimes children about nine or ten years are two years ahead of, of children in government schools, and the same is in Pakistan. Why is this? It's because private schools are accountable to the parents, and they're accountable. The teachers are accountable to the school owners. The school owners, remember, are from the communities as well. And they're accountable because they can be fired. Teachers can be fired. Parents can go and complain. It's people from their communities, and they're also paying. If you pay for something, you feel it's accountable to you. If something's for free, oh well, you know, got a free bit of bread, it was moldy. You know, that's it. You don't, you, you don't feel like you can go and complain. But if you're paying for something, you guys all paid for your tickets today. You came. If you offered for free, something was on the telly, Wales repeat of the football or something, shall I go? No. But you did. You came because you paid. This is accountable. The IEA is being accountable to you. And also parents want choice. So it's quality, accountability, and choice. I thought I'd show you some of the schools, what the schools look like, because obviously you haven't seen some of them. This is a school in Nigeria. As you can see, it's just a wooden construct with a tin roof. You've got two teachers at the front, two blackboards. There's two classes going on, one class on this side and another class on the other side. This is in Hyderabad. You can see this school owner really wants to be noticed. A great outside to his building. Uh, entrepreneur from the community himself. Uh, very brightly coloured uh, school outside. This is in Kibera, True Vine Academy. You know, great names. In India, you have very British names like Oxford Academy or St. Joseph's because parents want to, their children to learn English. And that's another reason in India there are these low-cost private schools because uh, the uh, medium is English medium. And that's what parents want. They want their children to learn English. In the government schools, they don't learn English. It's the state language and Hindi and maybe Urdu. And this is one of my favourites. This is Fred Fredson International School. He's got two classrooms, but he's very proud there in Nigeria. So is international aid appropriate for low-cost private schooling in developing contexts? We've attracted the attention of DFID now. So what happens if aid starts being sent to low-cost private schools? Because we've got all that accountability, haven't we? It's, it's a market that's already thriving. 
It's, it's a great market. So what happens if we start throwing international aid at it? Well, I've just met David Freeman, which is a, a great privilege. And one of the ideas could be to increase access, and increase access for the very poorest. So for those children who can't go to private schools at the moment, who can't afford to, why not suggest targeted vouchers? So targeted vouchers have been shown to work around the world, randomized controlled trials in lots of different places. So maybe that's one way international aid could be focused. What about conditional or unconditional cash transfers? That's just giving money to the poor and letting them decide how to spend it. Why do we think that the poorest can't take control of their own money and know how to spend it? So there's two ways we could think about. Two other ways of trying to improve low-cost private schools could be to give them a loan. But it's a loan that they have to pay back, not something for free. And how about looking at the regulations? There's lots of corruption there, getting your school recognized. So let's look at how we can have accreditation agencies. So I'm just going to finish up now, thinking about international aid, going back to where we started. Really, the evidence suggests that it has to be scalable, sustainable, impactful, and accountable. It has to be efficient and effective. Because if it isn't, it's going to be a complete waste of our money. What I've always suggested is use gold standard research to inform policy, not planners who think they know best. But actually, the Department for International Development have taken, taken those words, and they're now giving 1.5 billion over five years for something they're calling a Global Challenge Research Fund. So they are actually putting money into research to find out what works for the poorest. But what about asking the poor what they want? When I was in Kibera, I said to a government school teacher, you know, what do you think about all the poor kids coming to your school? Isn't, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, isn't it? And she went, but nobody ever asked us. Nobody ever asked us what we thought. She said they've got their own schools. They've got their own schools down there in the slum area. Let them stay there. I don't want them in my school. No one ever asked us. So ask the poor what they want. Again, the Department for International Development are doing a really great job here, and they're looking at making markets work for the poor. And just regarding schooling, how can we improve access, equity, and quality? Well, you should do that through market-led initiatives and market-based solutions, encouraging entrepreneurship, which is already there, and not dependency. This is where I started last year. This, this is one of my favorite pictures, if you watch my talk from last year. And you see that I love this picture. I took this picture in Hyderabad some years ago. Why do I love it so much? Well, it's vibrant, isn't it? It's colorful. It shows everything that I see in a slum area. I see entrepreneurship. I see competition, and I see the poor doing things for themselves. They're not sitting around waiting for us to do something for them, aid agencies or World Bank money. They're not. They're getting on with it themselves. And I really like it because you can see in one of those top corners, there's an advert for a low-cost private school, which I didn't even see when I took the photograph. Galaxy School, an English medium school. If you want to read a bit more about sub-Saharan Africa, international aid, low-cost private schools, maybe this is all new to you, or maybe you've read all these books already before. These are some books that I would recommend, uh, including Dabiza Mayo's Dead Aid. But we've got Why Nations Fail, obviously my book, International Aid and Private Schools for the Poor, and also lots of other people's books there. But there's some really great reads uh, to have a look at. Well, I mean, it's been <laughs> wonderful speaking for the second year running. I hope I've given you something to think about. And thank you very much for having me for the second year running. Thank you.